to draw your attention to a small and seemingly inconsequential detail of this gospel story. It was winter. Did you notice that? People were celebrating the festival of the dedication. You may know that festival by the name we still use for it now. It's called Hanukkah. Do you know the story of Hanukkah? A long, long time ago, a nation once known as Judah and later known as Judea, the land of the Jews, of God's people, was part of a, shall we say, slightly less than vast empire ruled by a man named Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. For reasons that I'm sure seemed justified at the time, Emperor Antiochus instated, instated a harsh series of policies against Jewish religious practice. I won't get into it, but one of the things that he did was to set up a pagan idol at the temple in Jerusalem and sacrifice pigs on the altar there. As you might imagine, this enraged the Jewish people. And a man, a priest named Judah Maccabee, led a revolt against Emperor Antiochus. After years of fighting, Judah and the other rebels, they called themselves the Maccabees, were successful in getting Emperor Antiochus to rescind his policies. But they didn't stop there. They continued fighting until they had completely driven the emperor's forces from their land and declared their independence. Not since the conquest by Babylon some 500 years earlier had the Jews ever had their own sovereign nation. And they wouldn't again for another 2,000 years but for this brief period between Emperor Antiochus and Emperor Augustus of Rome, the Jewish people were free. The victors welcomed the, uh, excuse me, the crowds welcomed the victors into the liberated city of Jerusalem by waving palm branches. Does that sound familiar? In fact, the Maccabees had palm branches stamped on their coinage as a reminder of this great victory. Now, after they reclaimed the temple, it had to be ritually cleansed from the pollution of Antiochus, right? So the Maccabees went in and found that the emperor's forces had defiled all of the lamp oil. None of it was clean, except for one jar, enough for a single day. So they lit it, and miraculously, that single jar lasted for eight days, long enough for them to press olives to produce more ritually clean oil. Hence, eight days of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is, in some ways, a kind of Jewish Independence Day. And so it's highly significant that these Jewish people come asking Jesus at the festival of Hanukkah whether he is the Messiah. What do you suppose might be behind that question? What do you think they expect Jesus to do? I can't help but wonder if what they're really asking is whether he is the long-awaited Jewish hero who will come and rise up and rescue them and cleanse them from the pollution of these foreigners ruling over them, just like Judas Maccabee. I wonder if they're looking for somebody to raise an army to defeat Caesar, like Judah defeated Antiochus IV. I wonder if Jesus knows this, and maybe that's why he answers them the way that he does. Something I notice about John's gospel is that often when people ask questions, Jesus doesn't answer the questions they've asked. Instead, he answers the question that they should have asked. Here, he doesn't answer the question about whether he is the next Maccabee, but he answers the unasked question, who are we? Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I'm not that kind of Messiah. He doesn't say, that's not what God does. What he does say, you do not belong to my sheep. So the next question, of course, is, Whose sheep are they? To whom do they belong if not to God? 
This isn't a question of religion or belief. It's a question of allegiance. It's a question of identity. The other St. John asks this question in a different way. After describing the scene we got last week of heavenly worship of God and the Lamb and the celebration when the Lamb is found to be worthy to open the scroll in God's hand, John of Patmos records what happens when the Lamb opens the seals on that scroll. The results are devastating. It's literally where we get the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The stars fall from the sky as the sky itself is rolled back like the cover on a tin of sardines. All the people of earth, from kings to paupers, are pleading with the hills to cover them up so they won't be seen and judged by the Lamb. Who is worthy to stand before the Lamb, they cry. They're frightened because the world as they know it is ending. But even in the midst of that terror, John looks and sees this that we see today, this multitude, people of every tribe and nation and language and race, wearing white robes, waving palm branches in victory. Just like the crowds welcoming Judah Maccabee into Jerusalem. That doesn't sound like terror to me. Who are these people? Why are they celebrating instead of cowering? That's the question asked in the text. And the answer? These are the people who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, anybody can tell you that dousing fabric in blood does not make it white. <laughs> Clearly, something symbolic is going on here. So, what's the symbol? What's white? White indicates purity, cleanliness, right? But in Judaism, blood is defiling. It's the blood of unclean pigs that desecrated the altar in Jerusalem. But this blood, instead of making things dirty, makes them clean. Why is that? Well, this is the blood of the lamb. Remember the lamb? The lamb standing in the midst of the 24 elders? The lamb that had been slaughtered and yet lives? the lamb who is worthy to open the seals of the scroll. The elders had praised him because by your blood, they said, you ransomed for God saints of every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests serving our God. His blood is purifying rather than defiling because rather than committing violence in God's name, he refuses the way of violence. He remains committed to God's way, even to death. And because of that, he alone is worthy to open the scroll. Because of that, even though he was slaughtered, he lives. And so his blood and his death paradoxically makes things clean rather than dirty. But there's another symbol at play here. The crowd of every tribe and nation and people and language, it doesn't just resemble the crowd outside Jerusalem, welcoming Judas Maccabee. It resembles the citizens of the empire in which John's congregants are living. Rome's pride is that it ruled the entire world. People of every tribe and nation and people and language called Caesar Savior. As John describes the terrors that occur when the seals of the scroll are opened, these citizens of Rome cower in fear. But then you get the citizens of this alternate reality Rome that stand up and rejoice in victory. It seems like John is making a statement here, don't you think? I think he's saying that even though it looks like Rome is in charge, looks like the world runs on power and wealth and glory and violence, there's an alternative. There's another way of being. One that maybe is deeper and more true than the way things actually look. 
You see, the way of the lamb looks like death, but it actually brings life. It looks like defilement and dirt, but it actually brings purity. It looks like defeat, but really it's victory. I think he's asking us, to whom do we belong? Who do we follow? Caesar or the lamb? But like I said, I don't think this is asking us to profess a faith. I think this goes far beyond a question of religion or even belief. The question both John of Patmos and John the Evangelist are asking is whether we know who we are. You've heard me talk before about who we are apart from who we think we are. Our true selves versus our identities. Our identities are formed by all the things that we know about ourselves, our likes and dislikes, what we're good at, things like that, as well as all the things that we've experienced, everything that's happened to us. All of those form an image that we project to the world and, if we're honest, even to ourselves. And that image is useful, but it's not really who we are. It is, as Thomas Merton says, a kind of smoke self, ephemeral and temporary. A real self is somewhere beneath that smoke self. God doesn't know that smoke self, that projected image, because God didn't create it. We did. But God does know our true self, who we really are at our core, because that's the person that God created the person who bears the image of God and shines with the light of God. The light that John the Evangelist says is the life of all creation, which came into being through the word. As I think about that and read this today, I can't help but wonder, if that's true for us as individuals, might it also be true for us corporately, for the world? I wonder if the world as we know it is a sort of corporate smoke self, an image, a system, you might say, that we have created and invented ourselves. I wonder if the world that God made good, the true world, you might say, is beneath that smoke image of reality. And I wonder if that's the reality, reality to which John of Patmos is pointing with his vision. It's obvious that the world works a certain way, right? Nice guys finish last. It's not what you know, it's who you know, and so on and so on. That's the world where Caesar and Antiochus and even Judas Maccabee thrive. Those, that's the world in which those people are the leaders. But what if there's another way? What if we don't need those kings to protect us and keep us safe and happy and healthy? What if what we really need is not a warrior messiah? What if what we're looking for instead is a shepherd? That's what John of Patmos is talking about. And that shepherd, he says, is the lamb. Isn't that, isn't that fun? The shepherd is the lamb. That's the other way around. That's another paradox, right? The shepherd is the lamb. Lambs don't shepherd, they follow. But here's this lamb that's a leader. John sees this vast multitude of people standing to greet the lamb in victory while all the rest of the world is hiding in fear. But what if all the people hiding in fear are the same people as are in the crowd? What if that's who we truly are? Lamb people, not Caesar people, not Maccabee people. What if the blood of the lamb, the way of God, isn't the stain of defeat or the smell of death, but the thing that actually cleanses us, that gives us life? Easter is a celebration of resurrection. It's the recognition that 
death leads to new life. What if, when the world falls apart, we were able to look past our fear and our despair at the ending of everything that we know and also find some little bit of joy because we can see that the fading of that smoke reality is the opportunity for the light of God's reality, the light of life, to shine through. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I wonder if we can hear somewhere deep down that voice of Jesus calling us, telling us that the world as it is maybe isn't as it should be. That something within us is calling us to more suggesting that maybe salvation doesn't belong to Maccabees or the Antiochuses or the Caesars of the world, that, that really it doesn't matter whose side they're on, they're all the same, that violence always begets violence, that maybe the salvation of the world belongs ultimately only to the one who created it, who really knows how it works. What if we're not looking for a Messiah, but for a shepherd? Maybe we've been looking in the wrong places.